Good day. I'm John Fernandez. Welcome to E-Newsline Live from AACSB's World Headquarters in Tampa, Florida. Business schools are more actively exploring their relationship with business and industry. In fact, just this past April, AACSB accredited schools voted unanimously to approve new accreditation standards which encourage executive and non-degree education. The 2013 standards also aim to advance active engagement of both students and educators with business practice. What does all this mean for AACSB schools and management education in general? Today we will discuss how schools can elevate their external engagement with the professional community to enhance their portfolios of educational offerings, as well as to increase opportunities to better align business education with business practice. We are happy to have as our guest, Christine Reardon, who's Dean of the Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver, and soon to be provost at the University of Kentucky. Uh, she'll share her insights on business schools meeting executive needs. Uh, Dean Reardon has led a number of initiatives and programs that respond to the educational needs of the corporate and community landscape. She has built a reputation as a leadership development expert and consults regularly with corporations on uh, uh, regularly with corporations on strategic planning, leadership, diversity, management, and team performance. Further, Chris is a member of the recently appointed AACSB Business Practices Council and member of the AACSB Board of Directors. Chris, welcome to ENL. Thank you, John. Great to be here. Well, it's great. I know you've come pretty far from your Rocky Mountain High to the lowlands of uh, Tampa, but uh, I trust your trip was uneventful and we're happy to have you here. Absolutely. This Glad to be here. Well, we'll get right into the questions uh, that our audience is very interested in this emerging topic of the executive and non-degree education uh, for a lot of reasons, but most recently because now they're talked about in AACSB accreditation standards. So there's a little extra motivation. Uh, the AACSB standards that were approved in April encourage schools to innovate, engage, and make impact. Standard 14 specifically asks schools to achieve high quality in executive education. What are your suggestions for schools conducting or planning executive education to promote meeting the spirit of the 2013 standards relating to executive education? You know, John, I was really happy to see executive education included in the new standards. I think as being a member of peer review teams and being a dean myself, I've noticed a lot of schools have really put an emphasis on non-degree executive education, and yet the peer review teams weren't looking at that or even talking about it as much when they were visiting campus with business schools. I think one of the suggestions that all business schools should take into account is that they have to think about their strategic portfolio. And executive education is one piece of that strategic portfolio of programs and services that they're providing. So as they lay out their strategy for their college or their business school, they have to really think through the non-degree offerings that they have as part of that portfolio of products and services. By doing that, it's going to put a greater emphasis on that area and something that many, many business schools do. So one I'd recommend that they definitely include it as part of their strategy if it fits with their mission. I think the second thing that people have to understand is that the standards and spirit are there to really emphasize quality. And so by putting executive education in the standards that helps schools focus on the quality of their education programs, just like they do on the quality, focus on the quality of their degree programs. So I think the second thing is to really think through as well the quality of the offerings that they have. I think the third thing that's really important for schools to understand is that peer review teams uh, are really only going to be looking at executive education if it's greater than 5% of a school's budget or their revenue. And not very many schools rise to that level, quite frankly, in their non-degree offerings. Um, so while the peer review team may be looking at it and helping them and providing consulting advice, it may not be in an evaluative sense as they do with their programs. So, you know, kind of thinking back through the standards, I'd say for schools, one, they have to think about it as part of their strategic portfolio, two, really focusing on the quality, and then three, thinking about how it fits into their overall revenue stream. Right. Well, those are good points, and, and schools must mind their mission. That That's fundamental to AACSB standards. The question is, in, in today's world and going forward, is a mission relevant 
if it doesn't include executive and non-degree uh, education and a close uh, relationship with business, I think that puts the school increasingly uh, at risk. And, and you're right, the 5% uh, platform uh, is quite a bit higher, about almost a third higher uh, than, or two-thirds higher than what we experience on average in the United States. However, most European schools uh, average 12% yeah. of, their, of their budget for executive ed. So I, I think it's, it's an area of real uh, uh, of opportunity, but uh, certainly the school must be following its mission first. Absolutely. Now, the Daniels College uh, has been heavily involved with the business community under your leadership. Some very impressive programs, uh, the number of executive uh, programs it offers, as well as other initiatives that aim uh, to foster discussion between the school and industry. I was especially impressed with the uh, the corporate partners program I hope you'll discuss. So please tell us why you think that this is something that you feel is so important in the work that you do at your school. Sure. So let me let me answer that in two ways. One, just kind of from a philosophical perspective, I think. Um, and then two, I want to get into some of the specifics about things that we've done in our college that many other colleges and schools can do as well. I, when you think about where business education is headed, you know, when we look out 10 to 20 years, it really has to be a partnership between corporations and business schools. You know, for business schools to think that we can offer and deliver business education in isolation from what companies are looking for is not feasible. And for companies to not partner with business schools and let them do it all on their own and expect you know, great employees from that is not possible either. So as we really start thinking forward, we have to really be considering how we most effectively partner together. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to develop business research that helps impact and change business. We're trying to develop students who become top talent employees for corporations. And we're trying to help solve, in many cases, business problems that exist in corporations. And that has to be fundamentally a partnership between companies and business schools. Now, what we've done in the Daniels College of Business is to really kind of take that philosophy and then work with corporations to say, what are the best ways we can actually partner? I think historically, business schools and companies would only think about the partnership in terms of recruiting students. So it was natural to come to a business school and say, I need interns, I need permanent employees, how can you help me? In our conversations with companies, we realized that it went way beyond that. They really wanted other types of ways in which they could engage uh, with the business school. So things like solving problems. What we ended up doing is we designed a whole portfolio of student consulting opportunities. So our students go into companies and help solve major problems every single quarter of the year. We also have the Daniels Consulting Firm where smaller businesses and nonprofits can put in projects that are being solved by the students. Uh, they also wanted some research that was being done. So it was a great way to partner for our faculty who were eager to get research data and to have real life projects to work on. So we've had partnerships with companies where we're solving some of their problems and giving them valid data to help solve those problems. And at the same time, we're helping solve the faculty member's desire to publish in top tier journals with some really strong research and data that goes behind that. They also, in an interesting way, want to continue on um, part of their professional development by giving back to the business school. So we have many executives, many companies that want to mentor students um, as part of their own professional development. And so that's been a great partnership um, from that perspective. Continuing education, executive education, when you think about the entire talent pipeline, it doesn't end when somebody graduates at 21 or 25. It continues on through their entire career. And so the non-credit executive education is a way for business schools and companies to partner across the entire spectrum of a lifetime. And then uh, clearly another way is just from a financial standpoint. We have had a number of companies say as part of their social responsibility and as part of their philanthropy that a business school and a university is a natural place for them to spend their dollars. And so it has turned into a philanthropic arm as well. Um, in terms of suggestions for other schools, part of what I think is important is to, one, start that dialogue between the companies and the schools. What are the ways in which we can most effectively partner and to think beyond just naturally recruiting the students as employees? 
So our corporate partner program really lays out all of the different ways in which a company can partner with a college. And when I go and talk with a company or when our corporate relations director goes and talks with a company or any of the other people who are external facing for the college, we have a whole portfolio of options and say, what works the best for you? Where can we start to begin this relationship? And then think about it from that standpoint. Um, you can start small in a relationship and grow very big. Well, I don't think Peter Drucker or Clayton Christensen could have said that any better. I was 100% convinced. And this is one of those times where when you're watching the recording, you might want to rewind and play this through a few times. Uh, absolutely, you make points that make uh, executive education, engagement, uh, critical assets to the school, and very important for each stakeholder group, from students to the employers to the faculty and the relevance of the research. We did a great thing 50 years ago by professionalizing business schools. Wonderful. And maybe we swung at times too close to the, the basic research end. Uh, but I think now is a time for a maturation of business schools to move between or from their, their historical effectiveness of producing very good business leaders to beginning through research and relevancy to begin to lead business. So the, the formula that you describe uh, is so right on for now and for the future for the relevant uh, and I think healthy uh, management education institution. I'll give you a great example. Just last week, uh, several of our senior faculty members and senior associate deans were meeting with a company that was interested in customer experience and really into big data analytics. And the conversation really centered around joining together as partners to create a research lab for the company, for the college, for the students. And they started exploring how they could partner to, one, kind of create cutting-edge knowledge on what customer experience was about, um, as well as to help serve the needs of our faculty members, research interests, as well as our students and the company. So they put together a, a joint task force between the company and faculty in our college to really explore whether the center can move forward and making sure that it has mutual benefits for both parties. Well, you've set up a great model. You shouldn't have trouble at Daniels recruiting students and recruiting faculty and having companies involved. Unfortunately, they're losing you, so I wish you luck on the recruitment at Daniels College. Thank you. The, uh, one more on the standards. The, the 2013 standards strongly encourage schools to engage both faculty and students with business practice. Uh, I think that's been more implied in the past than, than directed. There are so many areas in which a business school can become better involved uh, with practice. Uh, you've described quite a few opportunities, but what are some other ways that business schools uh, can enhance their relationship with the business community? Mm -hmm. So again, we deeply involve the business community in, in many aspects of our college because they provide insight and voice into areas that perhaps we don't necessarily have. So our business advisory council, we call it the executive advisory board, is a strategic board that provides advice on major issues. They don't have governance. Of course, that's handled by the faculty and within the college, but they do give input um, from their perspective on major initiatives. And while it may not change 180 degrees, every initiative that we've brought to them and they've provided some voice on has changed probably 25 to 30 percent based on their input. The other thing we've done quite effectively is we've brought in focus groups of employers as well as potential students as well as past students are really around some of our graduate degree programs to talk to them about the curriculum and their perception of the outcomes and the skills that the students are graduating with. And our professional MBA program and our executive MBA program have undergone pretty dramatic changes every 18 months or so based on the feedback that's coming from the marketplace. And that's pretty important. Again, faculty govern the curriculum. This is just input into the insights into how we're doing it. We're looking at launching a world executive program that has uh, engaged a number of different executives, people from around the world on the types of skills and global competencies that are needed today. So, you know, we've used it for curriculum development, for mentoring, for strategic advice, for, um, gosh, providing speakers to our students. We've got a great CEO speaker series where we've brought in Gary Kelly, the CEO of Southwest, John Mackey, the co-CEO of Whole Foods, Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, giving students kind of a, a different perspective on leadership. So I think 
Uh, I would always say we're only limited by our own lack of creativity and how we can actually partner with businesses because it really should permeate most of the activities that we do within a college. Well, I, I think you're a person of primary and byproduct uh, benefits because I also noticed that in your corporate uh, partners program that one of the benefits was that the speaker series, there's some priorities given yes. to those individuals and participating in the uh, and seating and being active. And I, I think that's another, uh, not just a good cross-pollinization, but, but a really good win-win situation for the program. Well, in fact, we also have an exclusive career fair for our corporate partners. And so we had one back in February, on February 14th, in fact. Um, and we had only 25 spaces and over 500 students were attending. And it was just set up exclusively for the corporate partners that were uh, had given to us philanthropically as well as were engaged with the college on multiple levels, and they loved it. They absolutely loved it because they had quick and uh, access to high talent. Many of them had needs, and all of them had multiple positions posted. So engaging in our speaker series is certainly a marketing coup for them because over 30,000 people get that, uh, getting to access to top talent. So there's lots of ways you can create benefits for people engaging very closely with college. Wonderful. What have been some of the challenges that you've experienced or have seen other schools uh, encounter in leveraging input from industry uh, in modifying curriculum to meet their expectations? You said that mm -hmm. about 25% of change comes from their input, which seems very healthy to me. Uh, but I, but maybe you've seen other schools uh, have a little more difficulty. Sure. That's a great question. I think, first and foremost, you always have to understand that faculty govern the curriculum. And so it's never where the practitioners are dictating or are designing the curriculum. Our faculty own it. I think the biggest challenges are twofold. One is actually inviting the practitioners to add voice. Um, I think sometimes that's a challenge for universities and for schools to invite other people in. It's just a cultural aspect. We don't naturally go and ask people a lot of times for their assistance or their perspective. And I think the second thing that is often challenging is appreciating the differences between faculty and practitioners. Um, I think sometimes we don't always appreciate what practitioners have to say to us in terms of our curriculum and our faculty don't always appreciate what the practitioners have to say. So I think uh, those are really what I call consider cultural challenges that um, any leader or any program director really has to think about as they invite in the external perspective, but they're not insurmountable. And in fact, uh, the culture in our college is such that it has become so routine to invite it in that a program rarely, I don't even know if I can think of a program that's gone forward where it hasn't at least had some input from an external source. Well, that's a good thing. I'd say it's a lucky thing, but I know you worked at it. Yes. Uh, it it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult challenge because companies are in business in a competitive environment for the most part, few monopolies, and the market drives the, the speed and, and alignment of their yes. decision-making. Yes. And, and academic institutions have a more reflective, uh, de democratic, use the term, a process yeah. and often these these mixed uh, environments they're they're like uh, coming from different upbringings, yeah. uh, different mores uh, clash. So it, it, it's it's very nice to hear, and I think gives hope to a lot of schools that have uh, maybe a more uh, of a wall between practice and business that they can build uh, a happy medium that works well. Uh, in advancing the yes. school's effectiveness. And I would say, you know, I, I have been very careful, particularly with our executive advisory board, to clarify their role, that it is not a decision-making body, that it is a, a strategic group, and that, you know, we are taking their input, but the ultimate decisions are made within the college. So on the major strategic issues, they understand that they are providing advice and input. At the end of the day, those decisions fall to myself as well as the team within Daniels. And the same holds true when we invite in focus groups for curriculum development is we very much couch it and set it up so that they understand that we value their input and we want it. And it will also then go through the faculty governance process where we really work through and, and kind of integrate their input as well as others' input. So I think one key 
is really communicating expectations and the different roles at play so that both parties feel appreciated and part of that process. It takes a lot of grace to make that work. Uh, business school advisory boards, which you've talked about to, to some extent, have increased in popularity during the last 20 years. We've held a seminar taught primarily by Pat Flynn for, for many years with advisory boards, and their reputation is a bit inconsistent as far as their effectiveness. And I, and I think that's important because I think they're critical success areas in the future. But you can, can you tell us the benefits of having the Business School Advisory Council uh, and, and the type of membership that makes them successful? And, and then how do you measure the Advisory Council's success? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I know Pat does a great job in terms of really laying out how to build an effective advisory board. I'll just share a story. When I came into the Daniels College five years ago, the business, or we call it the Executive Advisory Board, was pretty much defunct. Um, it really hadn't been used effectively. And I went and I met one-on-one -on -one with each of the members at the time. And I said, I really would like to design a board that is strategic for the college, that are thought partners with me, that bring in an external perspective. If I have a heart issue, I want to be able to bring it and say, what do you think? Here, here's what I'm thinking around it. What's your perspective on it? I'd like my leadership team to be able to bring in some of these topics as well as some of the program leaders. And without fail, every single one of them agreed that they didn't, they felt underutilized and that they didn't feel like they were a valuable part of the college and that it was really a name only board. So I think one of the things that I've seen where they haven't been effective in colleges and schools is when they're not used in the capacity that the people are expecting to be used in. So one, I would suggest that executive advisory boards or business advisory councils generally should be at a strategy level. Um, two, I think it has to be clear that it is not a governance board, that in fact it is an advisory board, and really emphasizing that piece of it. Um, three, in terms of the membership, you know, again, all schools have different needs, so that has to be custom designed towards their needs and the areas that they're focusing on. In my particular situation, I first and foremost wanted really smart people on the board. And I also wanted people that could help make connections. So we ended up with people like the CEO of Visa and the president of Toyota North America, the CEO of John Fanville, and the list kind of went on. And we also made sure we had representation from local as well as geographic differences. So we've been adding international members as well as U.S. domestic members from all across the United States. Um, and that's pretty important, again, because if I'm looking at it from a strategic perspective, then I need diversity. Of perspective. So I would say uh, the advice for colleges and schools is to really think through what your strategic portfolio is and where you might be asking them for advice, and then align your membership around people that can help you with that. In terms of measuring success, um, I can share with you how we do it. We lay out every year kind of what we would like our board to help us with, and we then align transient task forces. So for that year, we might have five different task forces around five strategic, major strategic initiatives that we're working on. Again, they don't do the work. Our leadership team and our faculty do the work, but we present them with ideas and get their reactions. So this past year is an example. We were really expanding globally, so we had our global task force helping us with that. Um, in terms of even membership for global advisory members, um, as well as some of the programming we're doing. Had a major initiative around branding and reputation, and they helped us with that. Um, we also had a major initiative around the financial stability and model for the college. So I had people actually getting down into that, got best, brightest finance people on that one, getting down into some of the models and numbers on that, pushing back on me on some ideas. Um, and so when we measure the successes, how much were they able to actually help us in, in the five defined areas that we lay out every single year? I, I think at the end of the day, as a dean, it has been, I can look back at the end of every year and say they have really been effective in helping me think differently as well as the entire college think differently about some major issues. Well, that's the way the model should work. Yeah. So congratulations. Thanks. How have executive uh, and non-degree uh, program offerings changed in, uh, in focus and delivery uh, during the last 20 years or 10 to 20 years? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that many, uh, particularly here in the U.S., and I wouldn't say as much um, 
in the rest of the world, but particularly here in the U.S., we've seen a move away from open enrollment programs where you just sign up for a class and more towards customized programs. So that has been a definite trend where it was becoming not very cost-effective for schools to offer the open enrollment. And so now there's more partnerships with companies to design very specific programs. I think the other thing that we're starting to see, which is really very fun, is I, I call it, um, and I've seen it printed this way as well, is we're seeing an unbundling of our degree programs and then a rebundling back into non-credit programs. So certificates is a great example. We just are launching this fall as an example, uh, a completely online certificate in digital media. And that was a concentration in our MBA program that was delivered in person. We have a certificate also in person, and now we've kind of unbundled it, redone it, and rebundled it into an online form. So we're starting to see a lot more of that. I think the other thing that people are starting to use the non-credit executive education for are for uh, creative and innovative programs and to really test the market before going into a full degree program. So we're starting to see a lot of innovative work. Um, and let's just take entrepreneurship as an example and family business. Um, and uh, in particularly my region of the country, energy entrepreneurship, because that's really popular. So it allows schools to actually kind of pilot what I would call areas before they launch into a full degree program. The um, publication of a few years ago, I believe it's in 2010, Rethinking the, the MBA that was done by couple of Harvard professors and one of our own now, Patrick Cullen, uh, <laughs> what it came down to, it said, uh, we want all this that you're doing now and we want more. Right. And then the market forces mm -hmm. are saying, no, we want it in a more compressed time frame. We want less time to degree. And it, it's a deflating unless you conceptualize how the certificate programs can supplement that degree program and make for an effective lifelong learning experience. With the change in societal demands over leaders, having a healthy certificate program, I believe you have about 18 of them, it is a very important complement to the degree programs, which are under pressure to, to really produce in that short amount of time. We've also found that it actually leads students to enroll in the degree programs. They may not be ready to commit for a full degree, yeah. but we have a great example where uh, somebody needed some background in finance because it was part of his job. So he came back for a four-course certificate and then went on for his Master of Science in Finance. And that will often happen with our executive MBA program as well as our professional MBA program. So we kind of look at it as actually a recruiting runway for then perhaps students coming back and finishing a full degree. Another check mark. Yeah. Well, what would you like to see schools doing more of in, in the area of, uh, of, of executive education and curriculum building in the next 20 years? I mean, are there things that that you don't see enough being practiced more broadly? Mm -hmm. You know, two areas that really jumped to mind. I'm going to go back to the concept of unbundling and repackaging. I think there's so much that we do within our own programs and curriculum that probably are not getting the same play that they really could. There's a lot of just exciting modules that could be picked up from things that already exist and moved over and offered in a non-credit format um, or even in kind of a webinar format or even a MOOC type of a format so that you're broadening reach of some of those. So I, I think business schools, colleges, and universities as a whole are really going to be unbundling and then repackaging is going to be a trend for the next 10 to 15 years. And that's pretty exciting when you think about what exists um, in our universities. It's a really ripe area for expansion. I think the second thing that we're going to see um, is uh, an advancement in the areas of the online education. And again, experimenting with non-credit executive education, I want to say it's safer, but it doesn't commit you to a full degree. So you can do some interesting work there. And I think we have to move beyond just a videotaped lecture to more of the interaction. When you think about video games and you think about how students play with video games and it engages you. So our next trend really has to be how do we make online education very interactive and engaging so that you don't lose anything from that method 
of online education or from that method of education. I think the third thing we have to be aware of in related to the online education is related to how people are actually engaging online. We have a partnership with Offer Software, which is in Norway, and it is the world's largest web browser for mobile applications. So mobile phones, tablets, they're the world's largest web browser company. And when you start looking at the statistics, the statistics for people using computers is going down, whereas the statistics for people using phones and tablets is going up, and particularly in other parts of the world besides the U.S. So one of our challenges is going to think, how do we deliver education in a format that also works on things like tablets, or perhaps even phones? Film at 11, but uh, I suspect there'll be other advantages to having that reach and yeah. uh, of your programs. Well, how is creating, delivering, and managing an executive or professional development non-degree program different, for example, than an MBA or master's program? And can you describe how the course development process is, is affected? Mm -hmm. Sure. So I kind of go back. My area of expertise, as you mentioned earlier, is leadership development. So I go back to really kind of the life cycle approach when we do our, our program and curriculum development. When we think about an undergraduate, traditionally, you know, there might be between 17 and 22. Um, and that's kind of an early life cycle approach. Our traditional MBAs here, at least in the U.S., have been between kind of 25 and 29. And then professional MBA and executive MBA are in the latter stages of the career and so when you think about curriculum development, what you're really trying to do is to target the curriculum towards the life cycle of where somebody is in their career. And I think that as we start really focusing on areas like executive MBA, those folks are generally 35 years and older with 10, degree, 10 years of management experience. And so you have to really think about what that curriculum should be. And we work a lot with partners, corporate partners, as well as former students around that curriculum development, what else can we be do to help set them up for success? So as an example, they have an executive coach. We have a whole different career model that we're using with them. Uh, we outsource some of our career services activities because they're better at able to serve that part of the life cycle for those students. Um, we can manage a lot of the others internally. So, I mean, in terms of the curriculum development, again, you have to think about that life cycle approach and, and talk with people who are appropriate to give you input for the skills that are needed from each one of those programs that are coming out in the different life cycles? Well, I think we're going to do this question, then, and then we're going to skip to the last prepared one because I want to get to the audience questions before we begin to run out of time. You serve as a member of the new AACSB Business Practices Council, a special committee of the board comprising business school deans and corporate members, members of the business community, representing really a broader race of private and public concerns. Could you share with the audience what the Business Practice Council is charged uh, to accomplish and how you think their work uh, may benefit uh, both business schools and the business community? Sure. I'm honored to be a part of the committee because it uh, has some really impressive people associated with it. It's a mixture of deans as well as practicing leaders from across different industries I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, one, the initial purpose of the Business Practices Council is to really begin that dialogue. How can we better partner between business schools and universities and companies and really start exploring ways in which we might be able to do that? So it's a mechanism for increasing, I think, the dialogue around that. I think the second is that uh, one of the goals or objectives of that council is to also increase awareness. So we want to think about ways we can increase awareness of AACSB schools among different industries and among different companies. And we also want to raise awareness among the AACSB business schools on how they could better partner with companies. So I think the second mission is really kind of an awareness raising and then third, I think one of the things we've talked about recently is are there things that we can do to provide services for our member schools and also for companies? Are there ways to promote um, the schools associated with AACSB to the companies and kind of the quality of the students that are coming out of these schools? 
Are there resources we can provide to the schools on lists of companies that are willing to partner? So I would say also service activities is a third thing that we're really looking at. The dialogue has just begun, and so I would suspect that it will continue for another year or so, as well as engaging other members of the AACSB community and their input into this. But it's an exciting, I think, extension of what AACSB has been doing in this area, and, and definitely one that's important and needed. Yeah, we're a little slow, but at least we're moving at business schools have been active with advisory councils and business for a long time, different levels. But we're 97 years old, and this is our first four-way into, into having business advice at the uh, on an ongoing basis yes. at the governance level. So I think it's going to be very healthy, and, and, it's, and it speaks to AACSB living not just its mission, but the intent of the standards that it's yes. asking schools to, uh, uh, to pursue. So we're going to take one more of our uh, questions that we had prepared, and this is sort of a capstone question you may have answered it number of these things in the past. Then we're going to go to the audience questions because we've sent them in. We need to do that. Uh, aside from stronger connections and collaborations between management, education, and the business community, what do you hope to see evolve between these two groups in the coming years? Uh, any other suggestions for schools considering a stronger force in executive education? Mm. You know, I hope... Uh Two things, probably it's a pretty simple answer because we've talked about a number of ways in which colleges of business, schools of business, and corporations can partner. But two pretty simple things. One would be kind of a mutual respect uh, for what each group can bring to business education. I think it's really important for us to embrace the idea of partnerships moving forward. And then I think the second thing is that we would see increased dialogue um, and increased partnerships and increased activities. As I mentioned at the very beginning, I just strongly feel that business education and education in general going forward is going to be all about partnerships. And the more that we open ourselves up to those partnerships and the more that we begin the dialogue around the partnerships, the more everybody succeeds and wins. So those are two things that I would hope for. Well, it's certainly the intent of the standards. And, and as we go to the first audience question, uh, ironically, with all we've talked about, we haven't delved into any great depth about the 800-pound gorilla in the room. So I'm going to read this question to you. Okay. How can a business school motivate faculty to become involved in design and delivery of executive case, uh, education when current business school reward packages, job evaluations, and promotion criteria, tenure, often focus on research-related performance, and some cases even more stringent than others, mm -hmm. uh, and do not always, most often don't, give sufficient recognition to corporate engagement, consulting, delivery, executive ed, uh, involvement in practice. Um, what, what does a school do uh, to try to help to rebalance that uh, pr priority uh, orientation mm -hmm. of the faculties? Mm -hmm. That's a really important question. And I'm going to go back to something that we talked about at the very beginning, which was kind of the mission of the school and then the strategy that's associated with that. Um, I think that if executive education is part of the strategy and part of the mission of the school, then there should be some mechanism in terms of the reward and performance evaluation that aligns with that part of your strategy and that part of your mission. It was a conversation we just had as well in our college, and it's a, it's a debate that often gets played out in many business schools. And the idea is, is that if you're asking people to engage in executive education or other types of outreach activities, then how would you reward that? And we ended up actually including it as part of our service for the college. Um, it has not made its way into teaching part yet, but I suspect at some point it might. Um, the other debate that goes along with that that's always controversial, talking about an 800-pound gorilla, is that if I pay you overload pay, and yet at the same time I also reward you through the annual pay, are you getting double rewarded for being a part of that? So I think you have to get those questions on the table and really answer them as it pertains to your school. Another question that commonly comes up is particularly for tenure-track faculty that are not yet tenured. You know, should they be focusing on executive education when research may be the primary? Again, I'm going to go back to the mission of the school 
and going back to the strategy. And you have to be very, very clear at each stage of somebody's career what it is that you're rewarding and making sure that they're staying focused with those if that is an outcome that they want. So with our our non-tenured, untenured assistant professors, we don't necessarily include in their performance portfolios every year. We don't include at all, actually, executive education. It's teaching, research, and then very minimal service. And so their, their individual portfolio focuses only on those three things. It's a complex question. Um, it's an important question. It's one that has to be addressed. I think the worst thing to do is to not have the conversation around the issues that are troubling around this extra pay, who does it, not aligned. Um, so it's a really great question and one that has to be answered. Kind of like the double reward system. The system we have around AAC yeah, everybody is really fees. Likes it's really reward. good. Yeah. It helps to motivate. <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, the, the reward I see is that you have, you have homogenous uh, merit pools, semi-homogenous, uh, in a single reward system. And your real reward for being really good is you get more work. Right. But, uh, yeah. but then hopefully that means you're promoted sooner and it all works out in the end. Yeah, but I, a good pay raise. Yes. So. Well, yeah, that's okay. A viewer in France writes, there seems to exist a research consulting dilemma along the same line in which business school professors taking the role of consultants oh, may present an ethical problem. However, they are still expected to offer service to the business community and the general public. Hmm. Um, could you share more about uh, your practice and suggestions on how to continue good and impactful management research while being close to the business community without becoming an operational consultant? Hmm. That's an interesting and full question. There was a story recently where a faculty member did engage in consulting and the company was found to have been engaged in a Ponzi scheme. And the faculty member ended up having to pay back or offering to pay back all of the consulting fees that had been associated with that. Now, he had not been engaged in uh, the unethical behavior or in the illegal behavior but it was just by association. So it is really complex in that regard. You know, if you are going to engage in consulting, you know, and the company gets into trouble, what, what kind of ethical implications are there? In terms of the research, you know, one of the things that I found, and this was something I did really early in my career, and also I did it with a lot of PhD students when I was working with them, was we would offer to engage in research projects companies are asked to engage in research projects with companies where we collected the data and we could then use it for our research and for publishing journals without identifying the company. And as part of the opportunity to collect that data, we would then offer free consulting um, that basically gave them feedback that was honest and direct and transparent. It didn't have an agenda that was associated with whatever the company wanted. So that was one way to actually partner where we could marry research and also marry consulting and at the same time do the things that we want to do and give feedback to the company. I think that with any kind of consulting or research that's done in corporations, again, I go back to laying out the expectations and kind of laying out the outcomes that are expected and really only engaging in those opportunities where it aligns with what you're doing personally as a faculty member and also with the values that you have. You know, you don't have to get into the operational consulting if you don't want to. I mean, there's many things I get asked to do that I don't agree to do because they don't align with kind of what I want to do personally or what I value. So, so it's an interesting question. It, it is an interesting question, and, and I think it presumes that, that there, it gives me the impression that the, the writer thinks that uh, consulting can be risky and may be bad, and... and um, you're, you're looking at someone that's a lifelong internal auditor, even it still impacts what I do and, and how I approach things. Uh, I think you have to be able to see uh, in your consulting effort where it's crossing the line. It's not, um, there, there's no uh, substitute right. for good judgment. 
uh, you have to employ that. But to not do consulting uh, on an operational basis is, is to impact potential effectiveness and relevancy, uh, reduce engagement. But I think you do have to be alert to that. when you might be getting into yeah. a difficult situation. We've had some well-publicized examples. Very likely the researchers didn't know what was uh, going on in the background or what was going to evolve in societal uh, challenges. But um, but the act of providing operational consulting, I think, is, it's good for academia and it's good for practice. Remember, it's all back to will business schools once again lead industry? And I, I think there's room for that, particularly in, in maybe more the esoteric spaces like uh, ethical leadership and social responsibility and sustainability of enterprises. Yes. It's a good opportunity. The next one is, a, oh, your bio references your role in leading a business operation of over $86 million. I kind of like the way you refer to that. That makes me feel good about you as a, as a CEO of a business school. Uh, do academic leaders such as yourself have to work harder uh, in professional networks to, to credibly position themselves as business leaders, and, and what has helped you? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I, you know, it is interesting. I, we are run as an enterprise, so I am run as a business, and putting in the eighty-six million is a reality. It's something that I manage to and lead to every day, and I'm held accountable for every day. So, I am actually running a business in the education industry. Um, and, you know, I think the credibility externally, and that's a great question to really think about it as a faculty member or as a leader within a college of business. You know, many times people will think about the education industry and think of you as a professor or a teacher and not really think about it as a business or an industry that we have to be mindful of that getting impacted with the changes. So some of the things that I've done personally to, I think, gain credibility is I serve on a number of nonprofit boards in my community, and I will serve in roles such as on the audit committee or the finance committee or on the strategic planning committee so that they understand that I'm bringing kind of a business expertise to that area. And again, this is gaining personal credibility. I write popular press opinion pieces for places like Forbes and Huffington Post and Harvard Business Review and Financial Times, and part of that is just you know, again, getting the expertise out there. And there are a number of business school deans that are doing that now and becoming thought leaders in that space. And that helps gain credibility as, again, we are thinking forward and how business should operate. And the other thing that I do is I give of my time pro bono. So I will often do uh, executive education for free for um, nonprofit organizations, chambers of commerce, um, other types of professional organizations, or um, I will go in and do a short one- to two-hour seminar with for-profit companies if they give a donation back to the college. And then that's kind of an entrance into it as well. So there's a number of ways, I think, that business school deans and faculty can really work to gain credibility within the business community. But at the end of the day, what you're really trying to do is what you mentioned before, is we're trying to position ourselves as thought leaders for helping companies and helping businesses think forward. Well, I think we all need to understand that higher education is at risk uh, as, as a business. Uh, and having the orientation towards viewing it as a business is very healthy. Uh, I see the work that Scott Cowens has done at Tulane to bring them back mm -hmm. from near death. And, and I read what Fethke and uh, Paul Cano wrote in Public No More. And it's very, very important that people with business acumen from a business environment that maybe are of academic orientation, but, but have business effectiveness, mm -hmm. begin to take leadership in higher education institutions because the institutions themselves are not set up for the market factors and business school leaders need to be leading higher education institutions. So uh, I guess I have to say uh, uh, lucky Kentucky. Uh, you know, I, uh, Kentucky has a reputation for those that follow basketball in the United States of getting the best of the high school uh, recruits to come to play basketball for them. And this happens almost every year. I don't know how they do it. But somebody there does a really good job recruiting and knows the talent when they see it. So uh, yes, they do. I, I think uh, I think you're going to be the right person at the right time for uh, Lucky Kentucky. Thank you. Uh, we'll take, uh, we've still, do we have any more audience questions? Is this a new one? Okay. Do you consider the rise in corporate universities 
to be a threat to business schools uh, and that employees, uh, employers and employees may favor internal customized programs that directly address the specific needs and expertise that company requires. I actually think it's an opportunity and a threat. I do think that corporate universities are on the rise, and I think that they are looking at ways in which they can reach very large audiences worldwide. And an opportunity, as an opportunity, business schools can get in there and partner. They may not deliver all of the programs, but they can definitely help design modules and get in there and help partner around the curriculum development and perhaps even the delivery of the programs. And so I view corporate universities as an opportunity to really get in there and start showing how you can partner. It's also a threat. If we don't make ourselves relevant for the companies, they will do it. They're going to do it anyway. And I'd much rather see business schools being in there and helping them with pieces of it um, and than not being included at all. The worst thing for, I think, business schools is to never be viewed as an option in helping companies develop their universities. And I think that Part of the idea of partnering with companies is so that you do position yourself as a strategic partner that can help with those types of activities. Sure. Well, firstly, I, I reflect back on what uh, Dean Tom Robertson of the Wharton School said at the accreditation conference last year. He said, you know, we're developing minds for longer term application. And he mentioned several prominent, highly market capitalized industries and performers that didn't exist mm -hmm. 10 years prior. Right. So that, that adaptability is very important. The customized development to meet a specific need of a company has its place, uh, but I think the academic preparation for what we don't know uh, has a greater place long term. So how about the last question from the audience? Uh, how do you think business schools could make research more relevant to business or perhaps help business see it as relevant to their needs and practices? Yeah, so two things immediately come to mind on that one. One is partnering around the research, as I've mentioned a few times during this broadcast, is that there are ways to go in with companies and talk to them about research interests as well as asking them what their issues are and partnering with faculty members, PhD students, um, to engage in kind of slash consulting research types of activities. That one you know, is a win-win all the way around. The other thing that we've actually done quite effectively is we have started translating our faculty members' research for practice. We don't ask our faculty members to write it, but we actually hire, and it's not that expensive, we hire an external writer to take the research that they do and then translate it into a 1,500, 2,000-word piece for practice. And so almost all of the work that the faculty are doing not all, but almost all of it has some relevance for business. And so having somebody that can read the research articles and then pick it up and translate it um, and then give it out to companies or put it out in the press has been very, very effective for showing the work that our faculty is doing and its relevance for business. Again, we don't ask our faculty members to do that because it's not necessarily a skill set they have. They don't want to spend the time doing it. But if when we do it for them and then they approve the press release that goes out or the piece that goes out to companies, they love it because they see, wow, you know, they're having an impact in the companies and um, without fail, all of them have received a positive response anytime we've done something like that. So I think the trick is to figure out a way to get the word out. And that's where some of this MOOC technology has become terrific because rather than even having to do it in writing, many faculty members are able to do short 5, 10 minute, 15 minute topics that then give some of their expertise out to companies. So figure out ways to partner on the research and then to figure out ways to translate it and get the word out is really going to be important going forward. Well, thank you, Christine. Thank You've you. done a wonderful job. I think for the audience, it's a high benefit to cost ratio of their executive education. Uh, I'm sure they've, they've learned a lot. And we do wish you well. Uh, you. Uh, we, go, we have some sadness that you're going to be a provost because we'd <laughs> love to have you as part of the dean community, but yes, you'll have you. great impact at the University of Kentucky. And to the Daniels College, just remember, you have a friend in AACSB, and we know you're mourning now, but uh, we're always here to help. Uh, I want to thank you, our viewing audience for around the world, for tuning in on this session uh, with uh, Dean Reardon. Uh, I also want to thank uh, our staff who makes this production uh, effective every time we do it. 
uh, in a very low budget. Our director, Sari Wakefield, and our production manager, uh, Jason, and, and uh, Michael, who does uh, the um, uh, production and recruiting of all of our great speakers, Michael Weimer, uh, and Hannah Drozdowski, who draws up all the questions. And I don't want to forget our marketing uh, effort and Sarah Hamm. All of you do a great job. I say this because uh, E! Newsline Live is going to be changing a bit of its uh, uh, sequencing in the future. We've been operating bi-monthly since 2011, and we've decided uh, that with the volume of activities going on and with the more effective marketing uh, objective, that we're going to move to quarterly. So our next e &L, uh, will be sometime in August, and thereafter, you'll see us every three months. Uh, be sure to visit our website for further information on this and previous episodes of ENL. Thank you, and have a great day.